brought to you by the Every Dollar app. Start budgeting for free today. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Rachel Cruz, number one best-selling author many times over, Ramsey personality and host of The Rachel Cruz Show. My daughter is my co-host today. Open phones here at 888 825 225. You call with your questions about your life. That's what we're here for. The call is free, and some say the advice is worth exactly what you pay for it. So we're glad you're here. Rachel, big day today. Another book launch. The third Rachel Cruz kids book is out. Ding, 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 ding. It is. I know. I'm so excited. So I'm glad when I can share. So this is the kids book on generosity. And I went with the sharing element because for our little ones, teaching them to open their hand and share is kind of that first step in generosity. Uh, but it, it concludes my series. I did one on contentment, gratitude, and this is the final one for generosity. So this is the uh, three kids book series, and the third one is out today. And they've all been bestsellers. I'm glad for what I have. I'm glad for where I am. That's contentment. Right. Uh, I'm glad for where I am's gratitude. Gratitude. And the first one's contentment. And then this one is generosity. I'm glad went for when I can share. And it's a three book series. And this is the third. This is the third one. So it's nineteen ninety nine at RamseySolutions.com in we the bookstore. So, so and again, sweet. Lauren just continued to uh, the, these world class uh, illustrations make the book. Yes, Lauren Gallegos is the illustrator for all of them, and she just, I mean, did a fabulous job. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really sweet book, and it's short. You're welcome, parents. Yeah, for it those of quick. you that do bedtime stories, they're nine years long. Yes, you this is a short one. You don't have that here. And, uh, and on each of these books, I always try to add an element for the adults at the end. So just a, a sweet reminder, right? When it comes to contentment, there's that. Uh, and then this one for gratitude, that that joy in life really is the gifts that God has given us from our brothers and our sisters and, you know, all of that to understanding that when we give, it is a joy unlike anything else that money can buy. It's the most fun you'll ever have with money. We had Jimmy Darts on yesterday, who's got the big YouTube channel. Oh, on yes. Giving money away. And we were talking about the power of generosity. And we teach you guys, as you know, to live like no one else so that later you can live and give like no one else and lauren even snuck that onto the license plate of one of the cars in there yes. so you'll have to look for the Sweet. hidden the hidden meanings in there's some little book. easter eggs in there there's a few few little uh few little waldo call me taylor swift we'll but look, i have my own easter waldo. eggs where's waldo yeah so there it is live like no one else on the license plate um probably need to get one of those for one of our cars for real that'd be Sweet. pretty cool i never thought of that because but nobody knows what it means unless they know what it means well it's so, just letters on that one yeah, yeah totally it's, it's, it's nuts but yeah anyway good stuff so i'm glad when i can share it's here it's on sale oh just in time for christmas and it's 19.99 at ramseysolutions.com in the store and of course um you can order it anywhere. You can order great books as well. The other two books in the series are only seventeen ninety nine. So you can pick up all three of them uh, for what fifty bucks, roughly, and um, a little a little over fifty dollars. And you'd have a wonderful little set for the grandbabies or for the babies, whatever yeah, it is. For Christmas, and so, good stuff. And uh, speaking as the grandfather who has a few grandchildren that might be accused of picking out the longest possible book <laughs> some of those dr zeus books go on for days and they have a way of finding this is the one i want to read papa david translation right. i want to stall bedtime as far as i can and so uh doesn't work with any of the three of these these three all get to the point and you go to bed yeah they're pretty fast and they rhyme they're very sweet great message but yeah we get to the point so you're welcome parents for that <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Lorena is with us in Dallas, Texas. Hi, Lorena. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, guys. How are y'all? Better than we deserve. What's up in your world? Good, good. Um, I just have a couple of questions. So I'll start off with that. Um, I feel like I cannot move out of my parents' house um, due to financial struggles that they're that they are having, and I'm also having as well. Okay. So, what causes you not to be able to move out? because of their financial struggles walk me through that they need your they need your rent 
Basically, yes, sir. And so, um, so I, since I moved back in, I've been trying to get rid of my debt and start uh, following the baby steps. But you and pay them rent. No, I do not. Oh, when why? How would it affect them negatively if you left? So um, they're right now they're in a rental property, uh-huh. and um, their city is actually planning on demolishing uh, the area that they are in. Is this the house um, you live in? Correct. How would it affect them negatively if you left? Because I don't think they could, you know, uh, I don't think they could move into a new house without my You're help. not paying them any rent. That's true. But so I there's like no in- net loss to them when you leave. It's a net gain. Yes, that, that is true. Because whenever they do have to move eventually, the rent that they're paying will be up more. Oh yeah, okay. than what they're paying right now, and then you would pay. You would start paying rent, correct, to help them do that. Okay, correct. Bad solution. Yeah, so that's why I feel kind of stuck. And you're I, not stuck. I it's just you got. It. You need to. Everybody's got to reset their expectations in this. Right. They're in an unrealistically low rental rate on a house yes. that's being demolished. Correct. So they cannot rent the same house three streets over. They can't afford it. Correct. So, so they need to I, move to a different area. Yes, sir. So that's why I just feel stuck. I feel like they're looking at me and it's I'm, not I you. have my hands It's tied. them. They need to move to an area they can afford to live. They're like grown ups and stuff. Right. Yeah, maybe but they it need is to act hard, like Lorena. It. I mean, it, but but in a family dynamic, I mean, I think Dave's calling out the the dysfunction in that that they're leaning on you to help them in their situation well or somebody made you feel guilty i don't know whether you took it on yourself or they did yeah so that that, that, that's what i would say to you is to is you have to be able to release that yourself because that is not your responsibility even though the dynamic may feel like it is and there's always a weird element with adult kids when their parents are in trouble to feel like they've helped me they raised me they gave me a roof over my head growing up so i in turn feel obligated and indebted to help them is that true Yes, no, that's exactly what happened. I had recently moved back a, a five months ago, and since they're not letting me uh, pay any rent, that's why I feel obligated to help them. Because they gave you that gift. Correct. Right. Well, and that's and that's a false obligation. Yeah, that wasn't the deal. Okay. The okay. deal wasn't you move back in, and so you're indebted to us for the rest of your life. Right. <laughs> that wasn't the deal. You move back in, don't pay us any rent, get yourself straightened up. It's a gift we can give you right now. We can't continue giving you that gift because they're making us move to demolish the house. And so now we've got to move to an area that's that's not even what we want to do because we can't afford to live here anymore. Right, correct. Lorena, how old are you? I'm 26. Okay. Yeah, yeah I just want to give you that permission to have that freedom to build your own life. And what it's going to force you to do as well is to say, oh crap, I don't have mom and dad as a safety net anymore because it's not good for them. And ultimately it's not good for me. So I'm going to have to make hard decisions as well. And it, that's a tough spot. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that's all coming to a head because of the situation, but I, w- I, would, I would look at it as a gift in that way. Yeah. It, it, five years from now, when you guys are all emotionally and financially sustained without leaning on each other, you're going to be better people and better for each other. This is The Ramsey Show. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Jennifer is with us in Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? I wanted to see what y'all would do with a pile of money. <laughs> I'm in I'm in Baby Steps 3D and 4, but... Then I found myself in storm number one. Surprise, I'm pregnant. And Oh, well, five congratulations. Later, thank you. Storm number two, five weeks later, I suffered a major medical event, found out I have an underlying condition, 
that will put me at risk for more major medical events. And we can't really address the problem for a year or two until baby gets here and we can do a lot of testing and investigate it. So I had been saving a bunch of money for a house, but it had been sitting in a high yield savings account, but those rates are declining. So would you guys leave it in high yield savings or would you move it into like a brokerage account to maximize yield? Because I feel like that goal is now three to five years down the road. How much money in your emergency fund and how much money in this fund we're talking about? My emergency fund is 50000 It's 12 months. Uh-huh. And this, uh, and this, money, house, this money is how much? But my house fund is currently at 150000 Okay. So you have $200,000. So this medical procedure, what's the financial dent that this might make? That's a million-dollar question. <laughs> Literally a million-dollar question. I don't know. Well, you have health insurance. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. And I have very good health insurance, but I'm also out of work and currently on unprotected leave because of everything going on. So all of that. What do you make? Change. I make 140 a year. What's your husband make? Uh, I don't have one of those. Okay. All right. Um, and so you're unprotected. You're not making any money. You don't have an income right now. Um. That is not a true statement. I had a bunch of sick time and vacation time. That oh, I thought you said unprotected me- leave. I thought you meant your own family leave act with no pay. Okay. So, again, what you've got to ascertain, not from a fear base, but just some actual analysis is, is this a $50,000 problem you're facing or a $200,000 problem out of pocket with your health insurance, with your potential loss of income that'll be unpaid once you run out of these other things. And I kind of think you got a lot of savings here. So I shouldn't tell you about my brokerage fund or my thinking fund. You, you, you're a savings maniac, girl. I love it. How much is in the brokerage account and how much is in the sinking fund? The brokerage fund is 80000 Mm-hmm. And the sinking fund is 30000 What's it sinking for? A car, vacation, travel. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. So now we have $310,000 to weather this. I think you're okay. Breathe. Right? Well, I think the, I think the the scary thing, Jennifer, is you don't have a lot of answers, and you won't have a lot of answers till after the baby comes. Correct? Absolutely. With the health situation, so I I I'm a no. There's no panic to do anything with this money. I would just keep everything. We would tell you to pause everything anyway, since you are pregnant. There's nothing else to like majorly do. And I I would wait till baby comes. You're good. Run some tests, and if if and if you're in the same position. In 18 months, financially, you're okay. And then you can make some big you know, decisions. But I think you can take a portion of this and put it in a brokerage account. Would you tell her to go get a house right now? Dave's kind of smirking. I feel no, like he, no, I wouldn't. I, I would sit where I am. And just yeah. you could throw it in a high-yield savings. And it doesn't matter what you do with this money for 18 months. But you weren't going to put this brokerage account down as the down payment on your house, were you? No, that was See, just, come uh, on. Reti- that was a retirement fund. That's not a retirement fund. It's a brokerage previously. account. Well, where I worked previously, they didn't offer. How much do you have in your four hundred one k super saver? Five hundred. Okay, <laughs> come on. Okay, you, you <laughs> well need to done, put you, when when this is over and you take your three b one hundred and fifty k, add the brokerage account to it for your down payment on the house. I want you to put two thirty down on the house when this is over right now i don't want you to do anything i just want you to lean into the security that you've built for yourself you are a master saver you're amazing saver but you're you're taking it too far but for today it's okay that it's too far until you get past this storm so when you get past this two storm the storm though um buy the house yeah buy the house and put all this money towards a stinking house 
You know, seriously. After med- after the the realization of the medical expenses and the on- and, and the, and and the lost ongoing income, tra- yeah, yeah, whatever's left, yeah, yeah, out of the brokerage account, out of the hundred and fifty, but a twelve a, a month emergency fund, no, stop that. You know, plus a brokerage account, just because I didn't have a retirement before, but I got a half million over here. You're in good. You're fine. You're gonna be so rich. It's unbelievable. You can't keep yourself from saving money. <laughs> you're amazing. Well so, yeah, done. So yeah, your challenge, Jennifer, is going to be resting in the peace of what you've created. Yeah. I mean, that's it. So this, so so lower the stress. Enjoy this pregnancy. <sighs> breathe, just like Dave was saying. Like you're good. You are good. Don't make big moves right now. Have the baby. But between now and baby, like you're you are you are secure and great. You're yeah. Good. And let's get the medical thing in your rearview mirror, and then let's get the savings trim back down to where it should be. And that's that, That's what I would do if I woke up in your shoes. Zach is in Charleston, South Carolina. Hi, Zach. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thank you all for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So basically, I was in a car accident uh, not too long ago, and the guy totaled my car. Um, and the settlement check um, is about 6000 and I still have 4200 or 4500 left over on the car. So I was wondering if I should pay off the car and then basically just wait till I can get another car or get another car and then like slowly chip off the the debt. You can't, they're not going to give you the check unless you give them the title for the total car. And you're not going to get the title for the total car unless you pay the loan off. That's a lien on the car. Well, they already gave, I already gave them the title and they, they gave me, they're sending me the check today. So I bet it's net of the payoff. They probably sent the payoff to the bank. Oh, okay. Because you got to lean on the car title. Right. Right, right. Yeah. Un- unless you did something that was not a lean on the car title. But I- either way, let- let's pretend that, that, I'm, that I'm wrong on this for some reason under South Carolina law and I'm missing something. Then when you get the check, pay off the debt. Okay. And then you've got like 1000 bucks left or whatever it is, 1500 bucks left to go buy a beater car. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I would do if I woke up. Yeah, in do your you have shoes. any money saved, Zach? Do you have like an extra thousand no. somewhere? No, I'm very okay. new to all this. Okay. No, you're great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The goal would be to get to to buy a, a car in cash. And let me challenge yeah. you, Zach. So we're in Nashville, and on Sunday, for whatever reason, maybe it's because I knew you were calling in, Zach, and the Lord spoke to my heart. But I was, yeah. I, I literally Googled five thousand dollar cars in Nashville. I'm like, because because we get this car call a lot, and people are like, yeah. well, I can't get a five thousand dollar car, and I looked up, and I'm like, oh my, I mean, you just can scroll and scroll, and they're not terrible looking cars. I mean, you know, they may be like He's ten years getting- old or something, but I'm just saying, you have fifteen thousand dollars. I would save up another two thousand, and you can nice. and you can get what a, a, you can get a twenty five hundred fifteen hundred fifteen hundred. I'm sorry, that's what I meant, fifteen hundred. Okay. But you can get a three thousand dollar car. Yes, and. Yes. They're, and, and here's the, and here's the trick. There. Here's the trick. They are out there. What was your old car payment? Uh, my, old, my old car payment was like four hundred. Okay, so I would save five hundred dollars a month after I buy my beater car, so that I can move up in car in six months because I don't want to drive this piece of crap for very long. Right. Okay. Yeah, five hundred yeah. bucks for six months is another three thousand dollars, and five hundred bucks for another six months is another three thousand dollars. This is how you get rich: you don't pay people car payments, you buy things with cash, and don't have payments. That's the goal, and that you're new to this stuff. That's the that's the bottom line of what we teach, brother. Proud of you. Thanks for asking the question. This is the Ramsey Show. If you want to listen in to everything we do around here, you can do it on the Ramsey Network app. Download it. It's completely free, and uh, including the last hour of this show every day. And uh, you can jump in and catch the video and the audio and whatever else. You can search it. There's all kinds of good stuff. And you can ask questions on the Ramsey Network app. This one is from Todd. 
Yes. Todd asks, should I consider converting my employer match each year in my 401k to Roth dollars and pay the taxes now? I'm 31 years old and wondering if converting the match each year will benefit our financial future in retirement. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes, 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 yes. You ought to do it and pay the taxes, of course, out of your pocket when you do that. Um, Especially, Todd, if you're out of debt. If, you're, if it's going to be a large amount of money out of your pocket because of this, you may not want to do it for a while. Just let it build up, and you can go back and do it all at once. You can do it anytime you want. You let, let it build up for four or five years and then do it all at once uh, at that time. I do mine every year because my company that I own is required to match my because I'm an employee of the company I own, which is weird, but I get a 401k with a company match and the match is required to be in traditional. And I roll it to Roth at this time of year, every year. And that creates that amount of money to be taxed on, but then I'm never taxed on the growth after that. Um, nor are my heirs because inheriting a Roth IRA is not anywhere near the problem that inheriting a taxable traditional IRA is. And so it even helps later on with your estate planning um, because I don't have a single thing right now in my name or my wife's name that's not Roth. I have rolled everything to Roth and paid all the taxes in it. So I'll have no required minimum distributions either at 72 and a half when other people will. So that's an interesting part of the equation. But yeah. Yes, definitely, uh, especially if it doesn't affect your get out of debt plan. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's taking money out of your pocket that you need to use to pay off your car, no, let's wait a year or two and do it later. Do you have to do it all at once? You you can do it every year at one time. The match for that year, you can do it. No, I know, but if you had a full one and you were converting a lump sum, could you divide the lump sum into half and just convert half of it, yes. half of it, yes. like take it at time. Yeah. If so you if you had a hundred thousand yeah. dollars in traditional and you wanted to roll it, but you didn't want all 50. the taxes in one year, yes. you could do 50,000 and then next year do 50,000 if you wanted to, that kind of thing. Yep. 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 That, and so you could let it build up if you're still getting out of debt and then go back and fix it later. Uh, I mean, you're only 31. So if you did fixed it at 36, it was still going to have all the benefits of it growing tax-free for years and years and years and years and years. Gus is in Boston. Hey, Gus, how are you? Hey, Dave, I'm good. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? So I was working um, a well-paying job, 100000 a year, uh, and I got laid off. Um, I've been looking for work, something similar, something paying about the same for the past few months, but no luck. I haven't gotten any interviews at all. Um, I believe that it's just the current market conditions. There's been lots of layoffs. This is in the uh, the biotechnology sector, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so right now I'm debating going back and getting a master's degree because I think it would make me more qualified, more likely to land one of these high paying jobs again. However, I think that I would need to either cash out a brokerage account that I've been saving for a house eventually um, or take on debt to pay for this. Now, I have no debt otherwise, not even a credit card. Um, I've been listening to you for years, and so I guess I'm really nervous at the idea of either cashing out this brokerage account, which I'm making gains on, um, or taking out debt to get another degree. But Are you married? Landing. No, I'm not. Okay. What have you been living on while you've been laid off for six months or three months? Uh, so I, I have an emergency fund, mm-hmm. uh, fully funded six months, um, but also I've been collecting unemployment. Okay. And you're living on the unemployment. Yes. Cause you're not touched the emergency fund. I can tell by talking to you. Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. How much longer does that run? So unemployment will go through the end of February and then I'll have six months on the emergency fund. But as you know, I don't want to touch that unless it's a true emergency. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gus, what's the line of thinking that this degree is the thing that will get you in the job if you haven't had interviews anyways? Is it, is it on the applications, like what you're seeing? You're like, oh, I need that advanced degree for sure. Or is this just a, it's going to look better in general, and you think that's going to help you? So um, previously, my title was Senior Research Associate, um, and I got that with a year and a half experience and a bachelor's degree. Now I'm seeing for the same titles, largely the same responsibilities, 
um, all of the postings are saying bachelor's or master's. And then um, I got a free trial, a LinkedIn premium, and it's been telling me that, you know, there's 60 plus applicants all with master's degrees who are applying to these same jobs with the same title. So I'm concerned that because a lot of biotechs went bankrupt this year, the market's been flooded with high quality applicants. Gotcha. So what did you, what was your day job? What did it look like? What did you do as a research researcher? Um, so, so it was uh, operating uh, automated liquid handling systems, you know, like pipetting, um, working in a lab, lab coat, goggles, gloves, the whole deal. Um, and so specifically, it's uh, next generation sequencing. So it's all sort of furthering research objectives of these large pharmaceutical companies. Got that, Dave? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I'm just trying to. What I'm looking for, and, and the reason I paused is what what I'm looking for is what that is, how that is applicable beyond just the narrowness of this field. Something else, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because um, uh, the the other thing is is that we're starting to see some early signs of the economy getting a jump start. And so by first quarter of next year, I think the job market may look considerably different than it looks today. That's an opinion mm -hmm. from, uh, from your perspective. Uh, what I don't know is the world that you're in and what the lab coat goggles and the Bunsen burner, how that applies to other industries other than the specific one you were in. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure that a master's degree gets you a job. Let's say, for instance, that 30% of the players in that nuanced area are now out of business. A master's mm -hmm. degree doesn't necessarily get you in the door on the remaining 70% because the job market shrunk so dadgum much that what does get you in the door is Ken Coleman's proximity principle. You know somebody that knows somebody there that they'll at least give you a look. And your one and a half years of experience actually doing the sequencing and actually doing the research is far superior if I'm the employer to uh, someone that got a sheepskin, got a master's degree. Yeah, so so now I'm at three years experience. That okay, was when that's I had okay. The three years previous, experience is far superior to a master's degree. I don't want someone that was taught to do it by a college professor. I love someone who's actually done it, mm -hmm. like for three freaking years. I think your experience is superior to their master's degree is what I'm saying. But you haven't just gotten your foot in the right door mm -hmm. to where someone will actually talk to you and will respect that three years. But within that nuanced world, the number of people walking around with a master's degree and three years experience is fairly low. You might have a bunch of kids mm -hmm. coming out of school with a master's and no experience, and I think you got them beat. I think you're holding a straight flush here. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to work Ken Coleman's system, and I'm going to work some other jobs, and I'm going to start expanding my idea, maybe I don't want to be doing this three years from now, five years from now. Maybe I want to apply these skill sets uh, in some other areas of uh, uh, research in the lab, but not necessarily this nuanced area. I want to broaden the, the, the scope of my search and uh, how applicable are these skills in other labs and in other situations, um, even petroleum or something way off the grid. I mean, where is it that there's a lab? I don't know. And I'm going to try to get in those labs because lab experience is lab experience. I understand it's petroleum would be different than gene sequencing. I get that. But, um, but, but I still, you would know more about going into any lab of any kind than I would because I've never been in one as an employee. So that's, you know, I, I, I think you've got some broadening, number one. Number two, I'm going to send you Ken Coleman's book, The Proximity Principle. And I want you to use that to get in touch with people that you know that know people that know people that get your resume looked at. Because I think you've got a trump card here. This is The Ramsey Show.
I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Thank you for joining us, America. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host, number one best-selling author. And the new book is out. The new children's book came out today. That means a set of three is now available. I'm glad when, when I, can, I share. can share. There it is. Teaching kids generosity, the last of the three. So contentment, gratitude, and generosity are the messages of the three books. This is the third in the trilogy and the final book. They're all available at RamseySolutions.com starting today. Great Christmas presents. Elisa is with us in, uh, or Alyssa rather, in Jacksonville, Florida. Hi, Alyssa. How are you? Hi, Dave. Hi, Rachel. How are you guys? Great. How can we help? So um, I was wondering how much a mortgage rate should decrease before it's worth refinancing? Well, that's a, it, the weird question is, how long are you going to, are you going to break even on the savings before you get rid of the mortgage is the way you look at it. So here's how you do the math. Okay. What is your current loan balance? 256. Okay. And so if you save one percent a year you save twenty five hundred dollars if you save two percent a year you save five thousand dollars does that sound right yes okay so if your closing cost if you're saving if your closing cost is uh ten thousand dollars to refinance i'll just make up a number okay then Mm -hmm. how quick do you get your closing costs back with the rate that with the savings that you have from a lower interest rate and so if you're saving two percent in your case you're saving about five thousand dollars a year you would recoup a ten thousand dollar closing cost in two years and everything after two years you're going to make money that's gravy on the biscuit after two years do you see how i did that yes so you divide the actual dollars saved with the lower interest rate into the closing costs And that gives you the break-even point. And that should be less than three years. Typically, people say two years. You need to break even on the closing costs in about two years. So a lot of times, it takes a one and a half to a 2% savings for it to make sense. The, okay. The average mortgage... uh, My mortgage mortgage rate right now is adjustable after 10 years. When does the 10 years come up? Um, not till 2033. Okay, so you got a little time to ride the market. And again, when the market is, uh, what's your current interest rate? 6.5%. Okay, and um, so, you know, you're, you're not going to get a 2% savings right now. No, <laughs> definitely no. not. And you're probably not even going to get a 1% savings today. You might, but some, depending on how you structure the loan, whatever. But that doesn't count points. We're not paying points to create a false thing. But the bottom line is the interest, the refinance saves you money on interest, and that gives you the money to pay back the closing costs, and you need for those closing costs to be paid back in two to three years for it to make sense. And that, that's how you run the actual calculation on it. And um, you'll have that happen long before your adjustable rate kicks in in 2033. I was going to say, in that many years, who knows what <laughs> the interest rates are going to look like. So Who knows? I mean, but the average mortgage folks out there uh, across the span of my 40 years of being around real estate and in the real estate business, uh, the average mortgage stays on the books only five and a half years, either due to refinance or sale of the property. And so you don't you you really don't keep a 30 year mortgage 30 years in reality. So very often, I mean a few people do. I'm talking about the average. And so you certainly don't want something where the break even on your refinance is 10 years in a world where the average mortgage has gone in five and a half. So that's bad. Uh, of course, also you would include in that if I'm paying aggressively on the mortgage, how quickly will it be paid off? Am I going to have it paid off before I before break that. even? That's, that's another true. thing you would have to look at. So. But we're just you're you're trying to look at the actual dollars saved as a result of the lower interest rate versus the actual dollars and closing costs. And that gives you your break even analysis from an accounting perspective. And that'll help you make the decision very, very quickly. The good news is, Rachel, that that's now a thing again, Um, that, you know, rates have softened a little bit. They're not up. They're you know, they're not they're not way up. They're not way down. But um, there's a lot of optimism there. out there, hope, and a yeah. lot of people starting to look at this. And four months ago, no one was even talking about that. They're just frozen, right, during the headlights. That 
And it's just fascinating the way real estate shakes out because uh, we were even talking on one of my shoots, the Rachel Crusoe shoot yesterday, that you know, in 2021, 2022, people were afraid it was a bubble and everything was going to pop and, and the, you know, because the, of how quickly price, prices rose and increased. And now they've just stayed there, which has made the market tough, right? To get in what you had to have in 2017 looks so much different oh, than yeah. what you have to have today. So it is difficult. But if you go to RamseySolutions.com slash real estate, that's kind of our real estate home base, if you will. And we have so much information because we know this is a big topic for people. So this is everything from talking about agents to your first time home buying or if you're looking to move what the market's doing there's articles podcasts there's so much there so if you have interest on real estate and more of what ramsey has to say you can go to ramseysolutions.com slash real estate and check it out check it out there matthew's in omaha hi matthew welcome to the ramsey show hi um so i'm looking to um basically minimize the taxes my parents are paying in retirement on their um iras that they're taking distributions out of um that's basically my question can't you can't no required minimum distributions are taxable you can't get out of them well they're so we're not in required minimum distribution yet so my dad's 66 and my mom's 61 why are they so, drawing on it how are they growing on it why are they drawing on it they need the money um i mean they're drawing on it basically for um you know, just like they want a deck. So they want to put a deck on uh, the back of their house. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking about drawing on their retirement fund. They're still making about 140 K a year plus around 20,000 in dividends. Um, so, and they've also got a, uh, they got five real estate properties with about, a, they're making about 60,000 a year. I think they're pulling. If so they have a $200,000 a year income. They can't figure out what to buy a deck. Yeah, so they're trying to put about an eighty thousand dollar deck on the on the house, the residential house. Nice deck. And um, I'm sorry. Nice deck. Oh yeah, <laughs> it will be a very nice deck. Uh, it's gonna have a covering, and uh, it'll be pretty nice. So, but yeah, so they're 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 looking to do that. But uh, it's kind of they were thinking about pulling a hundred thousand dollar out, hundred thousand dollars out on the house. How much do they have in the retirement? Home. Uh, in their portfolio, they have about two point two million. Okay, and then they have about a million dollars worth of um, real estate that it makes rent, and then they have yeah. about a million dollar yeah. residential house. Okay, I think they've got this figured out. I don't think they need you or me. Um, I think they've got the money, and when you pull money out of a traditional IRA and you got two million dollars in there, and you pull money out, it's going to be taxable. There's not a hack on that, man. There's no hack. It's just taxable, period. Uh, that's the problem with the traditional instead of the Roth. Uh, that's why we want to move as many people towards Roth as we can, because when they get up here, if it was in a Roth, it'd be a no-brainer. There'd yeah. be no taxes Is there any time it. to pull money out of retirement if you're still working, you're at retirement age, you can do it without penalty? Um, is there ever a time you'd say, yeah, yeah, use your retirement for well, that? They, they can do it without penalty. And they can pull this hundred grand out of there, and it's two point two million. They can afford it. Yeah. But he's wanting to not pay taxes on it. You can't You're do that. Pay yeah. taxes on it. There's yeah. not a hack for that, dude. It's just taxable. Period. And there's not a there's not an offset on it. If there's an offset, you know, um, you know, right. interesting. So I I'm probably personally not going to do that if I'm in their situation I'm going to budget for the deck they can afford it it's not going to kill them it's not bankrupting them but they don't want to pay the taxes on this it's an ouchie I hate taxes I don't want to pay the taxes on it either it's an ouchie so I'm going to find another way out of sixty thousand dollars worth of real estate income and a hundred and forty to get the rest of this paid it's that simple uh, that's going to be my plan so. That puts this hour of The Ramsey Show in the books.
Today's question comes from Kevin in Phoenix. He says, I know you say to put 20% down on a 15-year fixed rate mortgage, but in the market I'm in, it feels unattainable. At one point, we hit our savings goal, but by the time we saved up enough, the home prices had jumped way up. We're debt-free, and we've been renting for a few years, and it just feels like we'll never be able to buy our first home. We're trying to run the baby steps, but don't see the light at the end of the tunnel right now. Is it okay to put less down in order to get into a house faster, or should we wait for house prices to come down? Well, that question at the end there, I'll answer that first. Uh, maybe both. We don't say you have to put 20% down, especially on your first home. We say it's ideal to put 20% down because you avoid PMI, private mortgage insurance, which is extra money you pay to protect the lender, not you. So as a first-time home buyer, I love that you're trying to follow the baby steps, you're debt-free, you're saving up for this house, and so I'm okay with you putting less down as your down payment in order to get into this house. And yes, you probably should wait for the housing market to cool off a little bit so you're not putting 100 over asking with no inspection. Don't do stupid stuff like that. Yeah, uh, Prices are not going to come down, Kevin. If you're waiting on prices to come down, you're not going to buy a house ever. Prices are not coming down. They are going to slow the rate at which they are increasing, though. That's what George is referring to, where the market cools off. Right now, um, uh, asking price means suggest you start bidding here. And uh, we want to get out of that kind of thing. And you're probably going to see that. We've seen interest rates tick up. The market has slowed down. We seem to be moving into our second quarter of contraction in the economy. This is known as a recession. And um, the Biden administration seems bound and determined to create one. So it looks like we're going to be there. And uh, that, that's where, I mean, politics aside, it's just observation. And uh, the so I think you're probably going to see calming down but we've never seen house prices go down in the modern america like since the 1930s except one time and that was for about six or eight months in 2008 when the bubble burst on the housing market and it was a te it was a financing bubble it wasn't a real estate bubble and so some markets uh phoenix was particularly hit uh, Las Vegas was particularly hit. A few other major cities that were super hot, they they contracted, and the prices actually went down. But that's the only time I've seen that, and I've had a real estate license 30 years. I can't find it anywhere uh, since the, what, the late 30s, 1930s. So, what, 100 years almost? Uh, and so I don't think you're going to see house prices go down. But we did have, was it 2020, house prices went up 32%, right? Yeah. It's a crazy. And stat. then in 21, they went up 14%, and they're projecting in 22 for them to go up 7%. So we're seeing a a slow the, the rate of increase is, is less, and I think we're going to continue to see that. But I don't think you're going to see house prices lower. So yes, I would buy, uh, but don't buy more than a fourth of your income on a 15-year fix, regardless of what you put down, and just understand you are signing up for PMI, which is about $75 a month per hundred thousand borrowed. So you buy a $300,000 house, you're paying an extra $225 a month for insurance that is a foreclosure insurance that pays the mortgage company if they foreclose on you. It does nothing for you. But that's what private mortgage insurance is, PMI. So if you can put so that, 5 to 10% down, and it's still a quarter of your take-home pay on a 15-year fixed rate. And then beat that thing down and get it paid down so you can get rid of that PMI, yeah. even after you buy. Turn around and get rid of it. Yeah, that's fine. I don't mind that. Um, and then the other thing you can do is you could uh, adjust your desires. But Dave, it's my dream house. It's called uh, it's a nightmare right now. It's called contentment. Okay, the dream house for someone in 1962 was 1,000 square foot, one and a half baths, one story, one car garage, one car in the driveway. That was the standard of living of the average American in 1962. Today, it is a microwave, a towel warming drawer, granite countertops, three car garage with electric garage door openers, which when I was a child were only for rich people. And if you don't have one on your house now, it means you're poverty stricken. A skylight and a jacuzzi. Ooh, got to have that skylight. 
That's living. A dog wash. Oh, that's true. I've seen those. Those are wild. I mean, this is standard equipment now. Wow. 3,000 square foot, two stories, the average home in America. It's gone up. So while house prices have gone up dramatically since 1962, you can't, young kids can't buy a house like they could in 1962. The average house price to the average income is completely out of whack. Well, the average house is completely out of whack. By the way, people think our advice is, well, Dave Ramsey wants you to only save up and pay cash, and you got to wait 20 years and you'll never get a house. That's no, not I, it. I, you know, and by the way, you will get a house. So, um, because lot, there's nothing here stagnant in the whole process. The, the, the point is, you know, no one can afford a car because the value of a car right now, a brand new car as a ratio to income versus a brand new car in 1970 ratio to income is completely out of whack. Well, the stinking car's out of whack, too. I mean, these cars are, you know, they're Now 50, 60,000 is normal. They're cars. wonderful automobiles. But by God, they'll fry an egg while you drive to work. I've never seen... They do everything. Everything. Rachel's for sure. You don't even have to drive anymore. They'll drive for you. I mean, and, you know, so here's the thing. I am not saying you shouldn't have nice things. I'm saying your nice things shouldn't have you. And you need to kind of adjust your mind because normal is such a high standard of living now compared to a few years ago that you cannot use 50 year ago statistics and say that the economy is completely out of whack and wealth inequality is lo has lost we've lost our minds because we haven't what we've lost our minds on is what we're purchasing